morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome you this morning to the adult Sunday school class of Grace Life Bible Church. Uh, Pastor Brian Ross, pastor of Grace Life Bible Church. We're glad that you were able to join us uh, this morning for the study. Looks like we got about three people watching right now. Hopefully we got some more who uh, will be tuning in as we get rolling. A couple things I want to mention. If you look at uh, YouTube right now, um, there's links. I made a comment uh, under the video uh, with a link to the notes. Uh, it says, uh, Grace Life Bible, here's, here's link to notes. And then also in the live chat, I also shared a link there. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, locate those notes. Again, they're underneath the video in the comments, and then they're also linked in the um, live chat um, that should also be running on your screen right now. Okay, so there's two places there where you should be able to find the notes uh, if you are so inclined to want to follow along. So I want to uh, welcome you to, to this class. Uh, this is lesson 114, lesson 114. And we started last week looking at the Coverdale Bible. And last Sunday we looked at the issue of assessing its impetus. And we looked at issues related to um, how the Coverdale Bible came to exist and what might have motivated Coverdale in his translation work. So before we get too far into this again, I just want to uh, say again that um, the link to the notes is under the video in the comments, and then also there's a link in the public chat, in the live chat, I should say, okay? So if somebody comes on here later and uh, wants to know where the notes are, those of you that are live, if you could uh, let them know or point them to that, I'm going to click off my live stream window now and uh, click onto my notes as we get into the lesson. Okay, so again, lesson 114 is today the Coverdale Bible assessing its source. So I want to get into the first point of the introduction there, so hopefully you found those and are able to follow along. Okay. Last week in lesson 113, we began looking at the life and translation work of Miles Coverdale. In doing so, we compared Tyndall and Coverdale as translators, as well as sought to ascertain the impetus for Coverdale's Bible. So we looked at Tyndall versus Coverdale as far as their ability, uh, as far as translators are, is concerned. Okay, Regarding Coverdale's abilities as a translator, we noted that he was not proficient in Hebrew and Greek and was therefore forced to rely on the Latin Vulgate, Luther's German, as well as other translations. So last week in Lesson 113, I laid out some, some uh, assumptions or some beliefs that I had about Coverdale going into this study about him okay one of them was that he translated the uh, Texas Receptus the Greek Texas Receptus into English and upon investigation of that that's that's not the case as we'll be looking at a lot more detail here as we get into the lesson this morning the Coverdale was not proficient in the source languages of Hebrew and Greek and so he's gonna be using the Latin a lot as well as Luther's German and a couple other translations that we'll be discussing as we uh, get rolling here point three in terms of the impetus to translate, there is strong evidence to suggest that Coverdale was employed via back channels by King Henry VIII and his associates, Sir Thomas More and Archbishop Thomas Cromwell, to translate an English Bible that could be sanctioned slash authorized by the Crown. So if you've been following these classes, you know that we spent a lot of time talking about William Tyndall and how Tyndall was, was basically always an outlaw for his entire translation career, if you want to call it that. And uh, he was, his, his translation was never going to be accepted or authorized by uh, the King of England or anybody else for that matter. And so there's evidence to suggest that I presented last week in Lesson 113 that it's through back channels that King Henry VIII, Sir Thomas More, and Archbishop Cromwell um, employed uh, Coverdale to translate. Okay? The strongest evidence for this is found in an examination of Coverdale's 1535 edition itself. The artwork on the title page, in addition to the epistle dedicatory to King Henry VIII, provides strong evidence to this end. This evidence, coupled with uh, other, albeit less clear, documentation, such as surviving letters and documents from high church meetings, furnish a strong case as to the impetus for Coverdale's work. So I showed you a couple images last time. Okay, Here's the title page for the Coverdale Bible from 1535. And at the bottom here, there's artwork. At the bottom here, there's artwork of King Henry VIII. So I want to zoom into that. I showed this last time, okay? So if you look at this, you can see from this image that King Henry VIII is seated on his throne, and he is passing out copies 
of the Coverdale Bible to his bishops and other church authorities, right? So this is the artwork that's actually on the title page. And then here is the top of the page for the epistle dedicatory to King Henry VIII under the most gracious prince, etc., uh, and head of the Church of England, okay? So that's the actual uh, documentation from a 1535 Coverdale Bible suggesting that there's a strong desire to have the king sanction this, even from the artwork itself, okay? Also, as we saw in the previous lesson, that would be Lesson 113, Coverdale's epistle get it dedicatory to King Henry also mentioned Queen Anne, okay, as the following image confirms. So here's the title, the top, of the epistle dedicatory to King Henry VIII. And then in the next line, the next paragraph, he talks about a couple other things, but this section down here in the corner here is where it mentions Queen Anne. Now, if you have the notes, you can see that pretty clearly, okay? But Queen Anne is definitely mentioned here, and we talked about the fact, look at the next point, since Queen Anne had already fallen out of favor with Henry VIII by the time Coverdale's Bible was completed, there was little chance that the crown was going to sanction slash authorize it. So there's all these sort of <clears throat> pieces that are moving here um, when we think about this, okay? <clears throat> There's another further piece of evidence that we neglected to cover in Lesson 113. When Henry finally did authorize the Great Bible in 1539, so about four years later, when Henry finally did authorize the Great Bible, some four years later, the task of translating it fell to Miles Coverdale. So when the king finally does sanction a Bible, Coverdale is going to be the one that translates it. Now, you take that clear evidence, that, that known established historical fact, coupled with the evidence that I presented to you um, last week and then reviewed with you just now, and it seems pretty clear that Miles um, Coverdale was probably um, very much interested in getting the king to authorize his translation. So the bottom of page one of the notes, the politics of the situation impacted the source and the printed history of the Coverdale Bible. A topic to which we will now turn our attention. Okay, so if you're following along with the notes now, we're at the top of page two, the source of Coverdale's translation. That's the point that we're going to be looking at now as we move on. Okay, <clears throat> so look at the first first bullet there under that point. Printed in 1535 in Antwerp by Jacobus von Merton, Coverdale's Bible was the first complete Bible in English. So that's a point we established last last week in Lesson 113. That said, there was an English law at the time. There was an English law that forbid the volume from being bound outside of Britain. So it was printed. The pages were printed. They were cut. They were all ready to go. But the law, a law passed a few years earlier in 1533, prevented a book bound outside of England from being sold within England. So the pages are printed at Antwerp but they're going to have to be bound in England by an English binder. Okay, so let's look at the point here by break. By this time, it was 1535, the English Bible was in great demand in England. In 1533, a new English law had passed compelling foreigners to sell their editions to London binderies. This was a blatant attempt to protect the binding industry in England. Jacobus von Merton sold the sheets already printed from the Coverdale Bible to another publisher, James Nicholson of Southwark, Southwark. Okay, Although printed in Antwerp, all surviving Coverdale Bibles have English bindings. So there's this law that's preventing a Bible bound outside of England from being sold within England. So the printer in Antwerp, he prints the sheets and then he sells the unbound sheets to this gentleman named James Nicholson in England, who is then going to bind them together into a completed volume, right? So here's my here's my uh, King James Bible, and you you know it's it's bound together. So imagine the sheets here being printed in one country, bought, and then bound in another. That's basically what's going on here with <clears throat> the Coverdale Bible. Next point, J.R. Dorr's book from 1888 titled Old Bibles, an account of the early versions of the English Bible, <clears throat> offers some interesting perspective on Coverdale's first edition. Contrary to common narrative advanced by many King James-only advocates, Coverdale did not translate from Greek and Hebrew. 
Rather, he utilized the Latin Vulgate and Luther's German Bible. So again, I mentioned this last time, that this is running contrary to a lot of the narrative that is uh, often advanced in, within the King James Only movement about the Coverdale Bible being the uh, being in the stream, uh, the, the correct stream, according to the two streams of transmission view, as well as this purified seven times view, okay? So um, J, J, J. R. Dorr says the following about this. He says, quote, Internal evidence proves that the first English Bible was not translated from the original tongues, but principally from the Latin Vulgate and Luther's Bible. Coverdale tells the reader, quote, to help me herein, I have had sundry translations, <clears throat> not only in Latin, but also of the Deutsch, or German, interpreters, who because of their singular gifts and special diligence in the Bible, I have been the more glad to follow for the most part. So Coverdale tells the reader flat out, okay, that he is following, what's he following? He's following the Latin and he's following the German. This is what he is telling the readers of his Bible. And he's saying that for the most part, that's who I follow. Okay? So if you go to the top of page three in the notes, you'll see the image of the title page printed at Antwerp. Okay? And you'll see that it's very similar to the one that I just showed you a moment ago and that we looked at net last week because it's the same image. If you look at the bottom third, you'll see the uh, the picture of King Henry VIII handing out the Bible, and then all the art artwork in in uh, around the edges. Okay, but what I want you to look at is the middle of that. Okay, that 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 dead center where it says Biblia, the Bible. Okay, the original Antwerp Bible published by Jacobus von Merton bears witness to this fact. Okay, so I'm going to go to my next image here. So this is what this is what I want you to see. Okay. Notice what it says there. It says, The Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, faithfully translated um, out of Dutch and Latin into English. Okay? So the title page itself, originally printed in Antwerp, says that the Coverdale Bible is translated out of German and out of Latin. Okay? And you can see that towards the bottom of page 3 there in your notes, that it's translated out of Deutsch or German and Latin into English. So this is an important thing, right? Because here we have the title page, the original title page printed at Antwerp, and it's saying that, this, that, that Coverdale translated from German and Latin, not Greek, not Hebrew, but from German and Latin of all things. Okay, uh, So I'm at the bottom of page 3. Regarding the original title page, A.S. Hebert states the following in his historical catalog of printed editions of the English Bible, 1525 to 1961. He says, quote, The title and preliminary leaves mentioned above are printed in English block letter, unlike the angular type used in the rest of the book. Variations of this title occur within the following, uh, occur, which the following is an example. Quotes, so he then quotes the text that I shared in the previous citation. Now both this title, hence styled the foreign title, and this leaf are printed in the same angular type which is used in the body of the book. No doubt they are relics of the, of the preliminary matter originally issued, <clears throat> which in all probability consisted of four leaves containing title, list of books, prologue, and contents of Genesis. Okay, um, has an imperfect foreign title. So the, the the point is is that this original title that I showed you was printed at Antwerp, and it was subsequently changed. Okay, <clears throat> the the printer. If you look at the rest of this quote, it says that uh, it appears that the printer who pr uh, promoted the sale of the edition in England canceled these leaves. So these original leaves that mention Dutch, I'm sorry, that mention German and Latin as the source, they are printed in Antwerp. The binder, the English binder, Nicholson, he buys them, he, he imports them, and he cancels the original leaves, and he substitutes in for um, a, a, some different preliminary material, okay? 
So it appears that he canceled these leaves and issued a fresh title, slightly altered, and seven other preliminary leaves, including a dedication to the king, all of which were printed in English block letter. English black letter. This printer, no doubt Nicholson, from whose press came the second edition of 1537, probably also inserted the map, which is found in some copies of the Bible. So you have to track with me on this, right? So it's originally printed in Antwerp because of this English law that forbids Bibles being public, being bound, bound I should say, outside of England. The unbound leaves are then tra- are then uh, transported or imported into England. This title page, the is ultimately canceled, and it's going to be substituted for a different title page, which I will get to in a minute and show you that it's very clear beyond doubt. Okay, so the first edition that makes it into England is claiming to have been done from German and from Latin. In his dedicata- dedication to Henry the Eighth, see below which was uh, added later, Coverdale stated the following regarding his source texts. He says, quote, so this is in the epistle dedicatory to the king. He says, quote, but have with a clear conscience purely and faithfully translated this out of five sundry interpreters, having only the manifest truth of scripture before mine eyes. So, he says that he used five interpreters to render this translation into English. That's in his own words what he says in the epistle dedicatory to King Henry VIII. In other words, Coverdale did not utilize original language, re- language resources while translating. Later in his prologue, Coverdale states the following. So this is later in the prologue. He says, quote, I was the more bold to take in hand and to help me herein, I have had sundry translations, not only in Latin, but also of the German interpreters, whom, because of their singular gifts and special diligence in the Bible, I have been the more glad to follow, for the most part, according as I was required. Very interesting language there, okay? First of all, Coverdale says in no uncertain terms that he used Latin and that he used German. And then he makes this interesting statement about being required to use those. Okay, Now, it's interesting, why would he be required to use those unless there's some requirement that's been given to him? So it could be there that Coverdale is sort of um, tipping his hand slightly, which we'll, again, get into here momentarily. Okay? So let's look at the next point. It's important to note that Coverdale makes no mention. He never mentions Tyndall or the Erasmus Greek text in any of his statements regarding his translation work. What does he mention? He mentions Latin and he mentions the German interpreters. He mentions being required to use those. Okay. He never mentions Tyndall and he never mentions Erasmus. He never mentions them. He never says they're the source of his work. No reference to them at all. Okay, Yet he clearly mentions German and Latin resources. According to, Coverdale's, uh, according to Coverdale's sources, Professor Norton goes on to state, so this would be uh, Professor David Norton, he says, quote, These interpreters were in Latin the Vulgate, the Vulgate and Progenius, and in German, Luther and the Zurich Bible of 1524 through 1529, all of which have left clear marks on his work. If Coverdale meant his five to be German and Latin only, so tactfully omit, omitting mention of his main source, the postscribed Tyndall, then the first was probably Erasmus's New Testament. So there's a thing here that we need to discuss, okay? He, if we're going solely by what Coverdale said, Coverdale claims no help from Erasmus, he claims no help from Tyndall, yet he explicitly mentions Latin, German, and other translators in the five sundry translations that he mentioned having used. Okay, So this idea here that Norton is uh, inserting in his quote about Tyndall is... Not something that Co- Coverdale claimed for himself. It's something that Norton is asserting. Okay. 
<clears throat> S.L. Greenslade states the following about Coverdale's five sundry interpreters in the Cambridge History of the Bible. He says, quote, Coverdale did not translate directly from Hebrew and Greek. His most, uh, his most preface, his modest preface, excuse me, speaks of lowly and faithfully allowing his interpreters given in number according to the dedication of the king, or to the king. They were the Vulgate, Penginian's Latin version from 1528, a very literal rendering of the Old Testament, Luther's German, the Zurich Bible of 1531 and 1534 editions, and Tyndall, or if Tyndall was not counted, Erasmus's Latin version, he did not use Tyndall's Joshua to Second Chronicles. Coverdale's scholarship was not sufficient for an independent choice between authorities on theological grounds. Okay, what that means is he is not aware enough, he's not proficient enough in the original languages, Hebrew and Greek, to be able to make these types of determinations. So he's reliant upon the translations of others, be it Luther's or the Latin or um, the Zwingli Zurich version. Okay, uh, let me find my spot here. It is not derived. Uh, it is not derived from any clear statement from Coverdale. So. The, I, th th that's an idea that I inserted there, okay? Though much revised from Joshua, Esther, where Luther and Zwingli largely agree, he relies on German versions with some preference for Zurich. For Job Maccabees, he trusts the scholarship of Zurich. Were independent of Luther, though, the Vulgate is used considerably for the Apocrypha. So we've got four or five different scholars here who are all commenting on this, and to a man, they are recognizing that Coverdale, that the source of Coverdale is not the Greek and Hebrew texts. Okay, um, if anything, he has more affinity for Latin than he does for Greek and Hebrew. Regarding the identity of the five sundry interpreters, Doctor Daniel, this would be Doctor David Daniel, adds, "Quote." The five sundry interpreters to turn out to have been the Swiss German version of the whole Bible made by Zwingli, printed in Zurich between 1524 and 1529, a version emphasizing grace and flow of phrase rather than exactness to the original, the rather curious and over-literal Latin version of the Old Tense Testament made by Pingenius, first published in 1528, Luther's German Bible, completed in 1532, the Vulgate, and Tyndall for the New Testament, and half the Old. Okay, So again, Norton, Daniel, and others in our day, in modern times, are saying he did use Tyndall, but Tyndall is not a source that uh, Coverdale ever claimed from his own mouth. Okay, He mentions German, he mentions Latin, he never mentions Tyndall, he never mentions Erasmus. Okay. Next point, Hebert's catalog is clearly the source of this last citation from Daniel. That said, Hebert adds the following statement that was not cited by Daniel, quote, In the main, his translation is based upon the first two of these, which in the context is referring to the Swiss-German version of Zwingli and the Latin of Pengenius. So, there's a lot to kind of try to wrap your mind around there, okay? I've had the benefit of about two and a half months of reading this stuff to try to sort through this. So, if you're just joining me now, you're, you might be, you know, struggling to, to kind of wrap your mind around that. So, let me try to help you with unpacking a little bit of this. <clears throat> so, let's go to the next point. <clears throat> there's much to unpack here. First... It is possible that Tyndall was the source that Coverdale was a source that Coverdale elected not to mention for political reasons. Knowing that any mention of the alleged heretic would doom his translation project before it got off the ground. So, if the Crown's never going to approve of Tyndall's work, for Co and Coverdale's the main impetus for Coverdale to translate is to get the Crown's approval then it makes perfect sense that if he used Tyndall at all, he never would have mentioned Tyndall. Because if he would have mentioned Tyndall, it would have put the kibosh on the whole project before it even got started. And remember also the statement that I read to you earlier where he says, as I was required. Okay, So 
that is a tip off that he may have been uh, following some set of requirements here. Okay. Second, the original title page, epistle dedicatory to Henry VIII and prologue taken together, mention at least two of the five source texts for Coverdale's work, German and Latin. Third, it seems highly unlikely that the Erasmine Greek would have been one of Coverdale's five sources given the almost universal agreement among scholars that Coverdale was not proficient in Greek unless he used Erasmus's Latin correction of the Latin Vulgate. So you remember back before uh, Christmas in the fall of 2019 when we were talking about Erasmus, Erasmus in his Greek text and parallel columns, in one column he had the Greek, and then the other column he had his revision of the Latin Vulgate based upon the Greek. So if Coverdale is using Erasmus at all, he is no doubt using his revised Latin, not the Greek. Okay. In a later paragraph, Norton goes on to say that Coverdale, quote, worked as Tyndall's assistant in preparing the Pentateuch. Consequently, Norton sees Coverdale as Tyndall's understudy, who naturally would have utilized the work of his mentor. But the question that we need to ask ourselves is, is that correct? Is that a correct assumption? Does that assumption on the part of Norton jive with the facts that we uh, sort of have on the ground here to work with? Okay. Now, Norton's evidence for this position that Coverdale was the understudy of the direct understudy of Tyndall, okay, not just influenced by Tyndall from afar, but the direct understudy of Tyndall working directly with Tyndall. That's what Norton is asserting, okay. Bottom of page five, Norton's evidence for this position is the work of John Fox in Acts and Monuments. So that's John Fox of Fox's Book of Martyrs fame which I told you in earlier lessons about Tyndall, unless we can corroborate anything John Fox says by sources outside of John Fox, it is not good practice uh, to solely rely on John Fox unless you can corroborate what he says. He says a tendency sometimes to over-embellish things and maybe not necessarily get everything to, uh, as correct as he should. Dr. David Daniel questions that Fox questions the Fox narrative on grounds of the following. So I'm at the bottom of page five, top of page six. Quote, Fox in Acts and Monuments had Coverdale in Hamburg for almost uh, for most of 1529, invited by Tyndall to help him retranslate the Pentateuch. The two men worked, Fox writes, uh, quote, on the whole five books of Moses from Easter till December in the house of a worshipful widow, Mistress Margaret von Emerson, A.D. 1529, a great sweating sickness being at the same time. Perhaps Coverdale was indeed there, yet the Fox story has too much against it. Okay, So there's too many factors outside of the Fox story to really rely on what John Fox has to say here. <coughs> so let's look at that. It is only a few lines in his in his last 1576 version of Acts and Monuments. So there's only two lines in John Fox that say anything about this, and they're really unsubstantiated. They're not corroborated. Okay. So Tyndall. So according to Fox, who Norton is relying on to make the statement I read earlier. Okay. Tyndall suddenly sails from Antwerp to Hamburg to print his Pentateuch and loses everything in a shipwreck on the coast of Holland. He proceeds to Hamburg and meets Coverdale there by appointment and sets about retranslating his entire Pentateuch. For Tyndall to have gone to Hamburg makes no sense. So what Fox is telling his reader doesn't make any sense about the relationship between Tyndall and Coverdale. Antwerp, where Protestantism first took root in the Low Countries in 1529, had many fine printers with established trade with Britain. Among them was the dependable Martin de Kaiser, who had already printed Tyndall's Mammon and Obedience. The Kaiser would go on to print his other books, including his revised New Testament in 1534. Tyndall had no reason to commit to an unknown printer in Hamburg, 
the first translation ever made into Hebrew, uh, ever made from Hebrew into English. His next most precious work after his 1526 New Testament. Coverdale, an educated Christian, was no doubt enriching company for Tyndall, and like Tyndall, he had an admirable ear for the rhythm, rhythms of English, but he knew neither Hebrew nor Greek and would have been of small use for the work on the Pentateuch. Comparison of Tyndall and Coverdale translating these five Old Testament books shows the distance in method between the two men and the unlikelihood of corroboration or collaboration. <clears throat> so, we cannot overstate the, the relationship between Coverdale and Tyndall as translators. Okay, The evidence is sketchy about whether or not Coverdale ever sat under Tyndall as a translator, okay? And if you compare their work, um, they don't seem the they don't. It seems unlikely that they corroborated on the Pentateuch as um, Norton and others have suggested. The shipwreck story is certainly dramatic. The most significant point against it, however, is that the prologue is it. it uh, sorry, though the prologue to the very Pentateuch is where Tyndall tells us most about himself, and he makes no mention at all, nor does Coverdale, nor does anyone else at the time. So, in 1534 and 1530, Tyndall that says nothing about this relationship with Coverdale in the prologue to either the 1530 Pentateuch, Deuter uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy, or his 1534 uh, revision of the New Testament. He doesn't mention anything about this relationship, this uh, understudy relationship that Coverdale had to him, and Coverdale never mentions it, and neither does anybody else. Okay, so John Fox, writing now in the 1570s, inserts this into into the narrative about Coverdale and Tyndall when nobody at the time ever said anything about it, including the two principal actors in this case, which are Tyndall himself and Coverdale himself. They don't mention this. Okay. So, bottom of, middle of page 6, the bolded statement above from the pen of Daniel further calls into question the influence of Tyndall upon Coverdale's work. At this point, Coverdale did not use the Greek Receptus, and his use of slash reliance upon Tyndall remains at best an open and unanswered question. So this is creating a this it, it, look if we're going to evaluate things based upon facts that can be established these create significant problems for the purified seven times argument as well as the two streams argument that is very popular amongst you know King James advocates um both of those two ideas the purified seven times as well as the two streams I've dealt with in previous lessons in this series if you are interested in finding out where to get that information. Now, everything I've said so far has been about this 1535 edition and the sources of it, what did Coverdale use, and, and a, a pretty detailed historical and textual analysis there regarding that. Okay, Now, here's the problem. If I am Nicholson, if I'm the English binder, book binder, and I've purchased this from the from the Antwerp printer, and I now have it in front of me, and I have on the title page that it's a translation of, of German and Latin, and now I'm going to, I've invested all this money into this, and now I'm going to try to sell this to the people of England, who up to this point are accustomed to the work of Tyndall, who has been translating out of Hebrew and Greek. So now I have a now I have a volume with a title page that says it's from German and Latin and now I'm going to have to try to sell this and try to convince the English public that they should buy this edition. So here's what happens. I'm on page 6 uh, the point that says given Tyndall. <coughs> so given Tyndall's earlier work with the original languages, Nicholson, the English binder, feared that his countrymen would not purchase a Bible translated from Greek, I'm sorry, from German and Latin. Consequently, he removed Coverdale's original title page and substituted it with the following. So this is the original again. 
It says, faithfully translated, or of the Old and New Testament, faithfully translated out of German and Latin into English. That's what the original says. So what he does, what Nicholson does, is he cancels this page and substitutes it for another page that simply reads, Old and New Testaments, Old and New Testaments of the Holy Scriptures, faithfully translated into English. So he ditches the original title page, swaps the language out, removes the mention of German and Latin, and instead and replaces it simply by saying faithfully translated into English. Okay? Now if you scroll down, you can see that on the top of page 7. If you're looking at your notes on page 7, you see the whole title page. Now, I want you to notice something here. These title pages are identical. The one in Antwerp and the one in England, they are identical to each other, except that language right there in the banner, in the middle, that removes the mention of Latin and German and just talks about being faithfully translated into English. All the other artwork, the artwork at the bottom of the page, the artwork around the top, the sides, everything else is exactly the same as what was originally printed in Antwerp, but except for that switch regarding the source, okay? So gone is the clear mention of the German and Latin, and instead of that, you have just the mention of faith faithfully translated into English. So the printer is definitely trying to sell volumes here and is afraid that no one's going to want to buy a Bible translated out of German and Latin. So go to page 7 and go underneath the image there. Okay. <coughs> In addition, much of the original Antwerp preliminary material was canceled and substituted for the dedication to King Henry VIII that we considered last week in Lesson 113. Following the dedication to the king, Nicholson's edition included a prologue, a prologue, Miles Coverdale to, unto the Christian reader. Nicholson was able to make these changes to the original project because, quote, because he not only, quote, bought the entire edition from Von Mertren, but also the original blocks of woodcuts, map, and title border. So he buys all all of the stuff, the woodcuts here, all of the stuff, he can make it look exactly identical, save that one change, because he not only purchased the entire volume, but all the woodcuts and all the stuff necessary to reproduce the title page. And so he's able to do that, add, and then add a prologue to the reader. So I'm on the top of page 8. <coughs> Very interesting stuff here. Very fascinating to consider all history that before I set out to do this, I had no idea about. No idea whatsoever about all the stuff that we're talking about right now. It's been extremely fascinating to study this and to look into it and really sort of uncover what was going on. Top of page 8. Coverdale did retain some of Tyndall's Protestant word choices, such as congregation for church, elder for priest, and love for charity, according to Greenslee. As we studied in Lesson 113, despite his desire to compromise, Coverdale's Bible would fail to garner the support of Henry's Romanish bishops. Blackford Condent comments upon this in his History of the English Bible. He says, quote, Notwithstanding, notwithstanding Coverdale's compromises, in the rendering of certain ecclesiastical words and the leaving out of objectionable prologues and glosses found in Tyndall, his, trans his translation met with no favor at the hands of the Romanish bishops. This appears from the fact that in the convocation of June 9, 19, uh, 5, sorry, 1536, a petition was agreed upon to be presented to the king for a new translation of the Bible. So they are not going to accept the Coverdale Bible of 1535, June of the next year. <clears throat> There's a convocation of bishops, and they are going to ask for a new translation of the Bible. So they're not going to accept Coverdale. 
The substance of this petition was that the king would graciously indulge his subjects of the laity, the reading of the Bible in the English tongue, and that a new translation might be forthwith made. So <clears throat> we get insight then into how that was received, at least by the church authorities under the king's jurisdiction. Despite there being no evidence that this petition was ever passed or acted upon, it does furnish us with circumstantial proof that the bishops of the newly established Anglican Church were not going to sanction Coverdale's Bible. John Fox records the following injunction, quote, given by the authority of the king to the clergy of his realm in the year 1536. So this is the year after the Coverdale Bible was finished, and it reads, quote, so this is the um, contents of the injunction also cited by Condon, okay? It says, quote, to every person or proprietary of any parish church within the realm shall on this side of the Feast of St. Peter at Vic, uh, Vincula, next coming, provide a book of the whole Bible, both in Latin and also in English. Okay? So he's calling for a Latin-English interlinear. A Bible in Latin and English. Okay? Pay attention to that. That's important. And lay the same in the choir for every man that will to look and read thereon and shall discourage no man from reading any part of the Bible either in Latin or English. So what he's calling for is a parallel edition. Latin on one side of the page, English on the other side of the page. Okay? Uh, lost my spot. Either in English... Um, but rather, but rather comfort, exhort, and admonish every man to read the same as the very word of God and the spiritual food of man's soul, whereby they may better know their duties to God, to the sovereign Lord the King, and their neighbor ever gently and charitably exhorting them, using a sober and modest behavior in the reading and inquisition of the true sense of the same, they do in no wise stiffly or eagerly contend or strive one with another about the same. So this is a very interesting thing. So this injunction here is calling for a parallel edition, a Latin-English parallel edition. Bottom of page 8. The injunction called for the production of an edition that contained both the Latin and English in parallel columns. This is fascinating. In 1538, Nicholson, now remember Nicholson, I know there's been a lot of names. Nicholson is the printer, the binder, who bought the text from Antwerp and switched the front material and changed the title page. So we're talking about the same Nicholson here. In 1538, Nicholson issued a quattro reprint of Coverdale's Testament in parallel columns along with the Latin Vulgate. So now here we are two years later, and the English binder is now issuing an edition that has Latin and English, Latin and the, and the Coverdale translation next to each other <coughs> in parallel columns. Okay, So it was going to be the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate of Jerome, as well as the English. This edition is also known as Coverdale's English Latin Diglot. And the title page reads, so I have that for you there in the notes at the bottom of page 8. I also have it here. It's kind of hard to see, but it talks about the Testament, Latin and English. Okay, And then it says, um, each correspondent to the other, uh, the vulgar text, commonly called St. Jerome, faithfully translated by Miles Coverdale. So this is the title page of the 1538 Diglot that has the Latin and the Coverdale English in parallel columns. So that's published and released in 1538. Go to the next page. So on page 9, if you're following with me, you can see the image there. That's an image of the page that I just showed you on my tablet. So find the language underneath the image. <coughs> Excuse me. According to Dorr, the Latin text introduced by Coverdale is the ordinary Vulgate of St. Jerome and was inserted to enable the clergy and others to convince themselves 
that this English translation was an accurate one. Huh. Compared to what? Not the Greek text of Receptus, but to the Latin Vulgate of Jerome. So again, the reality here, the documentable reality of the situation is so wildly different from what the two streams of Bibles narrative would have you believe. Okay, The two streams of Bibles narrative is an oversimplification that has never been historically proven. It was the brainchild of Benjamin of, of the Seventh Day Adventist Benjamin Wilkinson. It was picked up on by Baptist fundamentalists, plagiarized and repeated, and then cemented into the narrative of the King James only movement in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. But it's never been it's always been an oversimplification, <clears throat> and it's never been that clear cut. It's never been that cut and dry from the beginning. He, Herbert states the following about Coverdale's Diglot in his historical catalog of printed English Bibles. He says, quote, The English text differs somewhat from that in the 1535 Bible, agreeing more closely with the Vulgate. Before leaving London in the spring of 1538 for Paris, Coverdale had settled that Nicholson should publish for him in London a New Testament with the Vulgate text and his own English version printed side by side. Coverdale approves it. He's aware of it and he approves it. <clears throat> and remember, there's this injunction about this exact type of edition being printed. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the book appeared in 1538 in a handsome form, but so full of misprints and errors that Coverdale repudiated it and immediately arranged for addition under his own superintendence at Paris. So, Coverdale approved it, he authorized it, but when he saw the finished product, he, he was very irritated with its many mistakes and misprints and errors and so forth. So if you look at the next point, <coughs> Coverdale was in Paris when the above volume was published, Upon examining it, he issued a corrected edition with the following title page. So you can see the language there on page 10. Here's that one. It's very blurry, so I just want to show it to you. So this is the title page from the corrected diglot that Coverdale is going to issue from Paris, fixing what he perceives to be the mistakes of the one issued by Nicholson in England. Scroll down to page, bottom of page 10. <clears throat> In the dedication to this corrected volume, Coverdale stated the following, quote, It is true that this last Lent I did with all humbleness direct an epistle unto the king's most noble grace, trusting that the book, whereunto it was prefixed, should afterwards, had, uh, afterwards have been as well corrected as other books be. And because I cannot <clears throat> be present myself by reason of sundry noble impediments, <clears throat> there inasmuch as the New Testament, which I had set forth in English before, doth so agree with Latin, I was heartily well content that the Latin and it should be set together. So, so Coverdale's saying, not only is he saying that his translation agrees with the Latin, he's saying that he approved the project to set them together in parallel columns. Okay, And so doing, I was content to set my name to it. So he's okay with it. And even so, and even so I did, trusting, though I were absent and out of the land, yet all should be well. <clears throat> and as God is my record, I knew none other till this last July that it was my chance here in these in these parts as a stranger's land should say stranger's land had come a copy of the said print which want i had prefused i found that it was disagreeable to my former english translation so it was not a true copy of the latin observed neither the english so correspondent to the same as it ought to be but in many places, both based, insensible, and clean contrary, not only to the phrase of our languages, but also from the understanding of the text in Latin. So what he's saying is, 
when he finally got this edition in Paris and he looked at it, there was so full of mistakes that he is then going to reissue it, rebrand it, repurpose it from Paris, a corrected copy. So what do we learn from this? We learn not only did Coverdale allow, that did he approve of it, not only does he say that his English answered to the Latin, that's his words, not mine, okay? He also says that when this was done, it was not acceptable because it had too many mistakes and errors and blind spots and so forth. And so this is going to then motivate him to produce a corrected copy, which is going to be issued the same year, 1538, from Paris. Page 11. Mark well. Coverdale was not upset that his translation of the New Testament had been printed in parallel columns along with the Vulgate. He admits that he gave his blessing to the project. Rather, he was upset that it was done improperly or in, quote, disagreeable manner. Consequently, from Paris, Coverdale took steps to correct and reissue the project. From this, we see that Coverdale has no problem with the Latin Vulgate and believed that his translation answered to it. When accurately viewed through the prism of history, Coverdale seems to have been courting political favor for the official sanctioning of his Bible by the English crown. He did this by seeking to demonstrate to the powers that be that his translation cohered with the Latin Bible of the established church. So hopefully now you're seeing a picture of the evidence here. They ask in this injunction, the king asks in this injunction in, in 1536 that it be printed in parallel columns. Lo and behold, in 1538, in the first half of the year, all of a sudden there appears a Bible that is printed in parallel columns, Latin and English, with a correction, I might add, also in the preface, not mentioning Queen Anne anymore, but now mentioning the king's current wife at the time, which was Queen Jane. Okay? So the truth... Regarding Coverdale's translations, uh, did I get? Yes. The truth regarding Coverdale's translation seems to stand in direct opposition to the standard narrative in the King James only movement. Coverdale did not translate from the Texas Receptus, but instead relied heavily upon the Latin Vulgate, one of the Bibles in the stream of corruption, according to the two streams of Bibles paradigm. Of transmission. It is high time that King James advocates leave behind unsound arguments in their defense of the King James. We need to just get rid of this argument. It does not help us because when the when we look at study and consider the facts, the facts do not cohere with that analysis. They just don't. So therefore it's not helpful to keep that as part of our and part of our narrative of how we're explaining things, okay, it just it's it's more messy than that. It's more muddy than that. It's 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 not uh, one brother, brother Richard Jordan compared it to the making of sausage. That it's messy, okay. So, last point. My analysis leads me to believe the following. So, after all the stuff that we've talked about last week and this week, I'm going to give you my analysis here in the end. My analysis leads me to believe the following. Coverdale used Tyndall where available, the New Testament and the Pentateuch, as his base text, but did not say anything about it for political purposes, as, uh, and his goal, should say, as his goal was to garner crown authorization for his Bible. So I do not believe that Coverdale was a direct understudy of Tyndall, I do believe that he utilized Tyndall where Tyndall was available, okay, but that he doesn't say anything about it because, for political reasons, it would put the kibosh on this project from the beginning. Now, let me finish. In doing so, Coverdale revised Tyndall through selective use of his five sundry interpreters. For those sections of the Old Testament for which Tyndall was not available to serve as a base, Coverdale relied heavily on Latin, German, and other non-English sources. In the end, the situation is far messier than the two streams of Bibles and purified seven times paradigms would have us believe. So, I think what we can take from that is 
Coverdale cannot just reproduce Tyndall without revision and expect anybody in the established church to go along with it. It's just not going to happen. So where Tyndall is available, he revises Tyndall through his use of German and, and other languages. But in those, in those places where Tyndall had not yet accomplished or finished his work, in those places he is definitely reliant on other non-English sources other than Hebrew, which is primarily going to take the form of Latin, German, and other non-English sources. So the situation with Coverdale is much more difficult, much more thorny, much more diverse than what we may have been led to believe. And I think that whatever we're going to say about these things in the end, it needs to cohere with the facts that can be clearly established by an analysis of the primary documents and the things that we have available to us to look at. Now, next week, in Lesson 115, we're going to start evaluating the nature of his translation. And we will kind of look at we'll look at it compared to Tyndall. We'll then look at it and may, how it might have influenced the King James as we start looking at the actual translation work of Coverdale. So I hope you found this uh, lesson interesting. I hope it was beneficial. I hope all of you were able to find the notes and um, locate those and be able to uh, follow along with me. I see there are about 20 of you, 21 of you uh, consistently who have been watching. Hopefully you found this edifying. And uh, I'm going to take a break now. I'm going to come back on at 1030 with our main Sunday morning message out of the book of Colossians. So thanks for your attention. See you next week.